Well, hey there. Welcome to the Strong and Sculpted Podcast, the podcast by me, Kim Constable, also known as the Sculpted Vegan, about all things strong and, of course, all things sculpted. I was actually singing to myself just a little minute ago there while I was setting up the podcast. I was getting my notes. I was like, the Strong and Sculpted Podcast by me, Kim Constable. Like I was singing and then I was like, whenever I just hit the record button, I was just like still in my sing-songy voice. So you guys have got happy, cheery Kim uh, down your, uh, I was going to say your earphones or wherever you're listening to this today. So anyway, uh, now that I'm blabbing, I'm just, stop blabbing, Kim, just get on with it. Um, I think the reason why I'm like feeling a wee bit excited, well, many reasons I'm feeling a wee bit excited, actually. One of them is that uh, I have the most incredible meal planning masterclass happening this Sunday. Um, and this was just like an idea that I threw out there. I was walking with Ryan one day and I was like, you know what? I, do you know what I need to do? I always get this inspiration whenever I'm walking. I was like, I need to run like a meal planning masterclass. And he was like, Kim, you've been doing podcasts on meal on meal planning and you've got PDFs on meal planning and you've got Facebook lives on meal planning. And, you, and, and I was like, I know, I know, but they just still don't get it. Like I need to do this really epic live where I show them everything, just show it to them. And he was like, okay, we'll do it. So anyway, we have this meal planning masterclass. We finally um, organized it. We, it's happening this Sunday. Um, this is a shameless plug for it, but I'm also going to tell you something very exciting. Um, it's happening this Sunday at 7 p.m. UK time. And it's $97. And I thought, you know what? I was like, meal planning masterclass probably get like, you know, it's $97. The reason why it's $97 is because it's three hours long. And you also get six weeks worth of my personal shred meal plans, which I'm doing at the minute. I'm on a shred. Those of you who follow me on Instagram will know this. So I'm on a shred at the minute. I have created six weeks worth of meal plans for myself. And I decided to package them all up with the recipes and give them all away for free to everyone who purchases the meal planning masterclass. So not only are you getting three hours of my time for $97, we also have a split payment of $48.50. You're also getting six weeks worth of meal plans. So you're actually getting about $500 worth of value for $97. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I've been planning the meal planning masterclass all week and I'm like getting so excited about what I'm going to teach. I'm literally going to teach every single thing you would need to know about calculating your BMR, calculating, and we're going to do it together on the, in the masterclass. Calculate your BMR, calculate your TDE, calculate how many calories you need to eat to burn fat or to build muscle. I'm going to teach you all about macro splits. I'm going to show you exactly how to download recipes from the internet and put them into my fitness pal at the click of a button. I'm going to teach you how to eat, how to get your protein, how to get your, you know, your carbs so you're not storing fat. All of the stuff that I have learned over the years as a vegan athlete, I'm going to teach it all in this masterclass. And I'm so excited creating the material and my team sent me through all of the design stuff today and I was like oh it looks so beautiful so it made me really excited and then the other thing that made me really excited is oh my god the butt camp the eight week butt camp finished on Monday and everyone started uploading all of their photos to Instagram and just you know just to, to share them and whatever and to the group and holy good shit oh my, I was going to say fuck. And then I was like, shouldn't say fuck. Fuck is a bad word to say. And I was like, can we say fuck on this podcast all the time? Holy good fuck. Oh my God. Like the, the transformation that these women have made is absolutely and utterly astonishing. And so I am so excited looking at all of these and the, the judges and we had like our judging meeting today. We have nine judges and we were all getting excited. And there's just so much good stuff happening in the company between the meal planning masterclass, then the official relaunch of the butt camp next week. We're starting a new competition, by the way, if you missed last round or you want to rejoin this one, 7th of September, butt camp is launching, relaunching again. Um, and what else? What other exciting stuff? Oh, yes. And then, oh my God, I'm launching a business mentoring program on the 21st of September as well. So we have so much good stuff going on. And then I'm launching another program called Basement Jacked, which is a, a home gym workout with barbells and dumbbells. And it's launching in October. And I was like, we have so much going on in the business at the minute. I just can't keep up. And I just cannot literally sleep at night because of the excitement of all of the stuff that we have going on. The company is growing so fast and it's so wonderful. And I just absolutely love it. So, so um, that was just a wee bit of housekeeping and a wee bit of PR for you there. Just slip it in the beginning. Do you know what I was thinking before I started this podcast? And by the way, this podcast is all about, right, 10 things I'm embarrassed to tell you. So we're not really going to, well, we are going to dive deep. We're going to dive deep into Kim Constable, into the world of Kim Constable. Before I get there, though, I want to tell you, don't forget, say it every single week. If you listen to this podcast, leave me a review wherever you listen to the podcast. Send me a screenshot on Instagram. You could be in with the chance of winning one of our Sculpted Vegan programs. We choose a winner at the start of every single month from the people who have left a review and sent me a screenshot of the review on Instagram. If you don't do that, you can't win. So make sure you do it. You could be the winner at the start of, what's the next month? September. We will announce the winner. And um, if you ain't in it, you can't win it. So make sure you follow all the steps. 
in order to win one of our programs. So what we're going to talk about today is things that I'm embarrassed to tell you. Why are we going to talk about this? Because I haven't been feeling very inspired. Normally, I get a bee in my bonnet about something or I see something coming up in the groups or people, somebody gets angry about something or people troll me or something. And I'm like, oh, yes, I'm going to make a podcast about this. And I get really excited and I frantically, I'm like typing on my computer, type, 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 like typing my notes really frantically. And then I get really into the podcast. And recently I've been like, nobody's pissed me off and I have no friction and I'm having a great relationship with my husband and my kids and no one in the company's pissing me off. Uh, not that people in the company normally do piss me off. Mark, who's listening to this, uh, my creative director, who's um, editing the podcast. Mark, love you. You never piss me off. Um, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? I haven't really had a bee in my bonnet about anything recently. And so I just thought, and then so I was chatting to Mark today. I was like, I'm a wee bit uninspired. And he goes, I'm surprised you've actually gone this long without being uninspired. So he said, why don't you do a Q&A? And I was like, oh yeah, a Q&A. That sounds really good and then it came to like seven o'clock tonight which is what it is now sitting in my office and I was like well I haven't I don't have any questions for a Q&A because I haven't asked anybody any questions so then I thought I know what I'm gonna do I'm going to tell you 10 things about me that I'm embarrassed to tell you and I've written 10 things down here and as I got to number five I was thinking oh, I have a terrible habit of talking and talking and talking and talking and if I don't keep this short I'm never going to get to 10 or you're going to be falling asleep like Kim okay, seriously we we tuned out hours ago because you're still going so I'm going to tell you 10 things about me that I'm embarrassed to tell you. And I don't get embarrassed easily, so I have to be honest. It was quite hard to find 10 things. But anyway, I did manage to find them. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. So uh, yeah, so without further ado, let's get started at number one. Okay, well, this one is a wee bit embarrassing. I do find find it actually still a wee bit embarrassing to tell people this. Um, not so much now that I'm successful, but okay, you ready? 10 things embarrassed to tell you. Here we go, right. Number one, now you're all like, Oh my God, what is that we're dying to hear? Number one, when I was younger, all I ever dreamed of was being taken care of by a man. And you're all like, okay, Kim, that's really not something to be embarrassed about. No, but let me just let me just let me tell you why it's embarrassing, right? Because everybody thought whenever I was younger, I like, and all I wanted, okay, well, let me preface this by being, ta being taken care of by a man. I wanted to get married, have babies and be a stay-at-home mom. That's really what I wanted to do, right? But this was very incongruent with how I was living my life because I was always, always like this. I was always purpose-driven. I was always you know, striving for perfection. I was always aiming for the highest thing I could aim for whenever I, you know, whenever I went to work as a waitress, I wanted to be a restaurant manager. Whenever I went to work as a salesperson, I wanted to be like the top salesperson in the company. I've always been highly competitive and very driven. I always wanted to be wealthy. I was like, I was destined to be rich. I was put on this earth to be rich. I am a rich person inside a poor person screaming to get out. And I, so I had all these goals and everyone used to say to me, oh, Kim's, you know, she's so driven. Kim's going to be so successful. Kim's, Kim's this and Kim's that. And people used to, you know, always talk about how successful I was going to be and whatever else. And, but yet inside, I never wanted to admit to anybody that all I wanted to do was to get married, be a stay-at-home mom, and drink coffee with the girls. And it wasn't that I was really maternal. I was really like, oh, I just want to have babies and like be really kumbaya and like, you know, and have like long flowing skirts and apron. No, it wasn't anything like that. It was more like, fuck, wouldn't it be nice to not have to get up every day and drive to work and be told what to do by a shitty boss that you hate and, you know, and live this boring, mundane life. I was like, imagine if you didn't have to go to work every day. Imagine if you didn't have to get up and you didn't have to go to work and you could just, you know, you drink coffee in the morning and, and all this kind of stuff. Do you know where I think that this stemmed from, right? And I've only just had this thought now that I'm talking about it. I think this stemmed honestly from my childhood whenever I, um, whenever I used to go to boarding school, because whenever I was really young, uh, we, I went to boarding school whenever I was seven, right? And boarding school was quite a hard place to be whenever you're seven, because you, because you you want to be at home, right? I only got home from Saturday afternoon until Sunday evening. That was the only time I got home during the week. And my parents divorced very shortly after we went to boarding school. So I only saw my mom every other week. I've, I've said this quite a few times in the podcast. Um, I saw my dad every other week and my mom every other week. And But I remember in boarding school, I used to watch things like, you know, things that reminded me of home. So like morning TV or whatever. So I didn't watch morning TV. You weren't allowed to watch 
TV and boarding school. You weren't allowed to do fucking anything in boarding school. They were so strict. And But like if you ever went to the matron's room or whatever and you saw some kind of, you know, program that you would have watched at home, like Home and Away or something, right? Home and Away used to be on at 5.30 in the afternoon. And if it was ever school holidays and Home and Away was on, Home and Away was something that you watched at home, right? But I remember being, I just always remember wanting to be at home. I just remember wanting to be at home, wanting to be safe and warm. And I was safe and warm and happy in school. Don't get me wrong. But there was just always this hankering of wanting to be at home, of not wanting to be where I was, of wanting to be at home. And there was something about home where your mom drank coffee and morning TV was on and, you know, and it was, and there was lovely warm food and there was food whenever you wanted it. You could go to the biscuit cupboard and take a cookie or whatever. You know, there was something lovely about being at home. And I think that I probably, you know, I probably carried a lot of that with me into adulthood where I, I just always had this fantasy about not having to do something, right? Not having to get up in the morning and go to work and get up when the alarm went off. And I remember having to get up, you know, every morning at 7.30 in boarding school and having to get up on a Monday morning if we ever stayed at home and went back on a Monday morning, you know, having to get up and go to school. And, you know, it was just all those feelings. And I guess that as I grew up as an adult, then I, I, I realized that, or as I think about it now, it wasn't that I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom or be taken care of by a man. I think what I actually wanted was was freedom. I I hated working for other people. I hated having to get up in the morning. I I really didn't like that because it was differently. See, I didn't mind getting up in the morning because I had horses whenever I was young, you know, in my through my teens and once I left boarding school and we always rode. I rode from I was born, practically born in the saddle and um, rode com- very competitively all the way through my teens and into my early 20s, into my mid 20s, actually, until I met Ryan up until the age of about 24, 25. And I, so I used to get up every morning, 6.30 and go out and muck out the horses and feed them and, you know, and ride out or whatever. And I never, never minded doing that. No matter how hungover I was, no matter how tired I was, whatever, I get up in the morning and I did the horses. But getting up to go to work or getting up to go to school was a completely different experience, right? Never wanted to do it. So I think the thing that I wanted when I was, when I was, you know, in my, my late teens, early twenties or whatever, um, I, I don't think I wanted to be taken care of by a man. I think I wanted freedom. And I think that, that what freedom meant for me was not having to get up in the morning and go and work in a shitty job for a boss that you didn't like for peanuts. And, you know, I just hated being contained. I am not a person who can work for other people. That is why I'm an entrepreneur. That's why I own my own company. I literally physically cannot work for someone else. It is not in my DNA to be able to do that. And I think that that's what being a stay-at-home mom or being taken care of by a man actually represented for me. I think it represented freedom that I never, ever had. But what's interesting now is, or what I realized after I became a stay-at-home mom, was then, of course, I met Ryan and I I got pregnant really quickly. I I only met Ryan like two weeks and I got pregnant. Didn't find out I was pregnant for like a few weeks after that, eight weeks or something. But we were delighted, right? And I remember whenever, I remember crying one day, I remember sitting in the car crying and saying, you know, and at, at the time I had, uh, I had actually just left my job, my very stable job in the family business to start up a new company. And then I met Ryan and I tried to enroll him in my new company. And it was like NLP training company. And uh, and of course, that, then I met him and I got pregnant. And so I was like, what is going to happen with me? I don't have an income and I'm pregnant and I hardly even know you. And we, we'd already moved in together and we loved each other and we were planning to spend the rest of our lives together. Now we have four children and we've been together 15 years, 16 years years. But um, I remember crying and he was like, Kim, and he put his hand on my knee and he said, I don't care if you never go back to work. And in fact, I would prefer that you didn't. And I was like, what? And like, this was like, this was like someone like a like Cupid or like an angel had descended from heaven and started playing a violin in the car beside us. And I was like, really? Because of course, all my inner deficiencies are now being filled. The very thing I've always wanted is to be taken care of by a man. And here is a man saying to me, because I always thought a man would have been, oh, well, yeah, you can have like three months maternity leave and then you have to go back to work. And here was Ryan saying to me, I want you to stay at home with our children. I want to have more children with you. I want you to be at home with them. I want them to know a mother who is at home, who's cooking for them and caring for them. Because that's what his mother, his mom always did. She was always at home, always baking cakes. And, you know, she was a real mom, mom. And she still is now, you know. And uh, she's amazing. I love my mother-in-law. And so he wanted that for us. And I remember just being like, I love this mom. Like, he just wants to take care of me. And it was just like the best feeling in the world. But let me tell you, see, once the babies came along and I realized that actually what came was being taken care of was 
accountability and you had to like, you know, justify what you were spending on things. And actually, whenever you weren't earning your own money and you were taking someone else's money, then there becomes a bit of a fucked up relationship because with the whole money thing, because then they can say, what did you spend that on? No, you're not allowed to have that. I'm going to give you X amount per month. And you'd be like, oh, shit. So, um, so yeah, so it wasn't quite as, uh, wasn't quite as dandy as I thought it would be, obviously. And what I realized was that you're never truly free whenever you're dependent on someone else, right? You think you're, you think you're going to be free, but whenever you're dependent, on someone else, you are never truly free. The only way to be free is to be truly free. Like I am truly free now. I'm completely financially independent of Ryan, of everybody, um, of everybody, like of everyone in my life. I'm financially independent. No, but I am. I, I could, you know, Ryan and I could divorce tomorrow and I could take care of myself financially. I would not need him to take care of me. Um, I, you know, and so we have an amazing relationship. We are emotionally free, financially free. We, we choose to be together because we love each other, but we are not dependent on each other in any way. And that is a very, very, very wonderful way to live. Let me tell you. But I thought that that's what being a stay at home mom or being taken care of by a man would give me. And I realized that it didn't, and it never, ever, ever would, but it was good that I got it. Cause then once I got it, I realized that actually it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. So, um, yeah, but I never wanted to admit that, that I wanted to be dependent on a man because everyone always saw me as this fierce independent go-getter, which of course I am. And uh, I felt that it kind of was a bit of a juxtaposition for what it was I was putting out in the world. I just secretly wanted to be taken care of, but I realized now I just wanted to be free. Okay. Number two, uh, things, 10 things I'm embarrassed to tell you. Most of you who follow me probably know this anyway. It's not that I'm really embarrassed about this, but the second thing is that I now make more money than my husband. It's interesting the first two have been about money, actually. I'm not really about money, being taken care of and finances, but I now make more money than Ryan, okay? This was hard for me in the beginning um, because Ryan has all, Ryan is very successful, okay? Now, he's not as successful as me. And do you know what? It has taken me a long time to be able to say that, right? Because, of course, we have this whole warped idea or this warped thing that, well, not we, but certainly I, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing, but I was brought up with, um, I think social conditioning tells us that, you know, you don't bruise a man's ego, you know, so, um, and I've always, you know, my, my father always worked, my mother was at home and that's the way it's always been in our family. It was always the men were the strong men who earned the money and whatever. And the women, you know, took care of the kids and looked after the family. And, and that's the way it was in, in, in my family on both sides. And so, Whenever I grew up, Ryan is very successful in his own right. He's a, he started his own company, a sports management company. Ryan used to play um, rugby. He was a professional rugby player. He played for his country. He was capped for Australia. He played for Queensland. Um, and then he moved to London and he played for Saracens professionally. And then he moved to Belfast. He played for Ulster before he retired. So he was at the very top of his game in professional rugby. And then he became an agent. He started his own um his own sports agency and now then he merged it with um, other companies and they took on more and more and they now have a large global rugby agency called Esportif. So Ryan is very successful in his own right, okay? But he doesn't earn anywhere near the amount of money that I earn, right? And so if you want to equate money with success, I earn an awful lot more money than Ryan. And that was really hard for me in the beginning because I, like I said, I, well, it was hard and it wasn't. Let me tell you what happened. Once I started earning more money than Ryan, I I began to get a bit kind of uh, self-righteous with it. Mean, not mean with the money, but I'll tell you what happened. I used to feel whenever I was married to Ryan and he was the one who earned the money, I used to feel that he... um not lorded it over me because he never did, but that he had ultimate control of the money, right? So he would have spent and bought anything that he wanted to buy, okay? He never checked with me on a large purchase. He never checked with me if he transferred money from one account to another. If he wanted, you know, Ryan Ryan controlled, and I liked that. I wanted him to control it. He controlled all of the bills in the house. He controlled, you know, who our mortgage was this, who our life insurance was with. He he controlled all of the, you know, so it was my job to look after the kids in the house and it was his job to look after all of the finances, the bills, and to earn the money, Okay. So, but with that, with that position, Ryan has always had this belief and we've talked about it loads of times, so he won't mind me sharing it here. Ryan has always had this belief that whoever earns the money, the most money has the most power. And it's weird because he has talked about that and he said, it's weird. I definitely believe this in my heart. He goes, I, I don't want to believe it in my mind. I, I don't want to say that out loud, but truly in my, in my viscera, I believe that whoever earns the most money has the most power. So even though Ryan would have said, no, I, I don't believe that, he acted as if that was the case. 
And so, and he actually used to say, I would have said, you know, why this? Or if I ever questioned anything or got like, but it's not fair, I want this or whatever. And he used to say, you know, not in a mean way, but Kim, whenever you're earning the money, you get to make the decision. And so our whole married life, I was like, I'm going to show you one day. Just you wait, you fucker. <laughs> you know, I love my husband very dearly, but I had these, I had these feelings of one day, one day, I'm going to make enough money to fly first class to Australia to, you know, to to take everybody out to dinner, to do all of the things that I wanted to do, okay? Because here's the thing about money. Money is, is how we express our value in the world, right? No one has the right to tell you what to do with the money that you have earned. You have the right to express your value in whatever way you wish. What do I mean by this? Well, Ryan... He loves to save money. He loves to think about the future for the kids. He think he he loves to put money away for, you know, and he calls it like he has this whole thing about, you know, such and such wealth and intergenerational wealth and all these kinds of things, right? So he's very careful with money, very considered with money. So in Ryan's mind, and we've talked about this extensively, because we do a lot of marriage counseling, just not because there's nothing wrong with our marriage, but because we want it to be even better. And so he's talked about how any the reason why he felt that he had the right to spend money in whatever way he wanted was because he felt that he made very considered decisions with his money. So he he didn't just spend it on this. So he saw the things that I wanted to spend my money on as frivolous. He was like, first class to Australia? That's absolutely ridiculous. Why would you spend 30 grand to fly to Australia? It's only 24 hours of being uncomfortable. Just go on economy. Or I was like, no, no, no. It's worth it to me because he never had to fucking entertain the four kids on a bloody 33-hour journey to Australia. He used to sit with his headphones on and listen to his, read his book or or watch his movies while I literally was leaping around, having children fighting over me the whole way who wanted to sleep on me and oh, whatever. But anyway, so it was worth it to me. I was like, 30 grand? Fucking cheap at the price. <laughs> give me two. Give, give me 10 of them. Book out the entire plane. I would have done it just for the comfort of going to Australia, but I don't think a man thinks that way. Um, and I wanted the kids to be comfortable too, obviously. So uh, the way I wanted to express my value in the world was very different to the way he wanted to express his value in the world. And so he used to see the way the things I wanted to spend my money on as frivolous, uh, whereas I saw him as a tight ass. And so we always had these uh, these kind of you know discrepancies or argu not arguments about money, but he didn't think that the way I wanted to express my value in the world was valid. And he felt that he was much more considered with the way, he, with his approach to money. So whenever I started earning loads of dough <laughs> and not even loads because I started building it up, right? I started paying myself, you know, ex, you know, I don't even want to go into figures, but I did start paying myself quite a lot per month. And and then once that, whenever I started paying myself quite a lot per month, which was more than Ryan was paying himself, by the way, I then, um, he, Ryan never thought, he never thought it would last. So he never, he saw it as, as temporary almost, right? So, and I remember being like, you know, and I would spend money. He'd be like, what did you spend that on? And what did you spend that on? And I'd be like, here, sweetheart. No, 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 no. You don't get it both ways. You don't get to tell me that whoever has the most money has the most power. And now that I have more money, tell me I don't have the power. And and I, but I did get a wee bit like, you know, hang on. We had to work through a lot of stuff because I got kind of not mean, but I did get very, I have, I have lived under the oppressive regime of Ryan Constable for the last 12 years. Or well, actually, it's only really the last two years I've started earning money. So for the last 14 years or 12 years, I'd be like, I've lived under the oppressive regime of Ryan Constable. And now I am free. You're not going to take it away from me. But it's it's a funny, it took Ryan, I would say, two years down the line, right? It has taken Ryan until now to truly accept that not only is my company wildly successful, but it ain't going away. <laughs> and that I'm the one who's actually created it and keeps creating it. We talked about this the other day and he was like, Ryan is so relaxed now about money. He doesn't care what we spent money on. He's He loves it when I, when I treat my family and I take them on holiday and I buy stuff for the kids. All the things that I've always wanted to do with my money. I'm extremely generous. Anyone who is close to me, any of my family, my friends, anyone who works for me, all our coaches, they will tell you. Like anyone's in trouble, boom, I send them money or I buy them stuff or I thank them or I, you know, I, I am so massively generous and I always have been generous to a fault. I've always been told, but it's never done me any harm. So I continue to be generous, law of reciprocity and all that. And um, and so anyway, it's been hard for Ryan and I to really come to terms with the fact that, you know, I, I earn so much more money than him and, you know, and he doesn't, and he's really just finally accepted now that it's, it ain't going away. Right. And, and I think what has happened as well is he said the other day that he's finally accepted that or he realizes, and he's heard me talk, you see, I've been coaching different people in the family or different people are starting online businesses. And I'll say, they'll say, what do you want to do with, you know, or, or, 
they'll say, I really want to do this, whatever. And I'll go, okay, here's what you have to do. There's four groups of people that you have to market to. This person, this person, this person, this person. You need to create this, do this, put this into a funnel here. And I start laying out this entire strategy for them. And Ryan's seen me do this a couple of times in under five minutes, lay out an entire sales strategy for someone. And he's just like, afterwards, he goes to me, wow, that was fucking awesome. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I don't know how you did that. That was awesome. And I'm like, I don't even think about it. That's just what I do. So he's seen me do it now again and again and again. The four-week shred, the eight-week butt camp, the jailhouse shred, the meal planning masterclass, the business program, the, you know, the sculpt and shred program. He's seen me do it again and again and again and again. And I think he's finally realized this isn't a fluke. <laughs> she actually knows what she's doing here. And uh, and I think that's made him really relax and just chill out now. And so Ryan is just, you know, we have such a wonderful marriage. He's so relaxed now. And I just get to spend, 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 which is what I love to do. And he gets to save a lot of it because I make a load of, I make a shitload of money. And um, yeah, so I earn more than him. And, but that has been hard for us to come to terms with because it's a complete rule reversal now. Like I, the office that I have, the offices that I took over that I now have for the business were Ryan's offices. I've actually taken over Ryan's offices and he now works from home. So so he is like literally doing my job at home and I'm <laughs> I've taken over his office. So I am now the man of the relationship. And well, I wouldn't say he's actually the female, but he's definitely doing, he's, he spent so many years working and now he's more chilled out and he gets to spend more time with the kids. And I get to be in his office and I get to be Ryan. And I absolutely love it. Okay, I really am talking for an awful long time here about these. I'm never going to get through 10. I'm going to have to speed up a wee bit. Um, okay, number three. What am I, what am, What else am I embarrassed to tell you? I've just realized this one's about money too. Fuck, I must have money issues that I need to work through. <laughs> must write that one down to work with on coach. Kim, work on money issues. Um, okay, so here's number three. I work better when I'm under financial pressure. I do. I work better when I'm under financial pressure. And actually, I realize that I have this pattern, right, where I overspend in my life or in my business because I thrive in the pressure of feeling on of feeling financially strained. I actually thrive feeling financially strained. I think I enjoy the feeling. I have some kind of weird cross wiring where I enjoy the feeling. And I do know and I'm I, I love doing these podcasts because I have all these realizations. Um so what, uh, interestingly, whenever I was younger, my dad um, used to run a very successful business, but he had a massive amount of stock. So he had a, he had a big overdraft that he ran sometimes too. And he used to kind of freak out whenever his bank statement came in. My mom used to hide it from him, right? And then she used to hide it from him until she knew she was going to be out for the day. And then she would set the bank, state, bank statement on the, gar on the shelf. Now, my dad was not in financial diffs, okay? In fact, he was really quite wealthy whenever we were younger. And he had this, uh, but he had, he loves to let off steam by being like a little vocally expressive, let's say. And he's very emotional, my dad, but he's, he's, he's a Gemini, right? So he swings between the two sides. But he's very emotional. He loves to let off steam and he loves to have a good suffer to make himself feel better. But as a young child, you don't understand this. Whenever your dad freaks out, out about his bank statement coming in, you think there's something wrong, right? But we lived in the lap of luxury. We had ponies. We went to private boarding school. We had a 52-acre farm. We So I'm, you know, I'm living very, very, very comfortably and yet my dad's freaking out about money. So I think I have some kind of weird hardwiring from my childhood where I, anytime I feel comfortable, I have to create some kind of pattern where I feel financially uncomfortable because that's what I learned as a child. That's a postulate I learned as a child. I'm actually going to have to write that down. I'm having all these crazy realizations. This is wonderful that I can work through with my coach. So um, I, I do work better under pressure. I wish that I didn't work better under pressure because it would be better to not be under financial pressure. And I think I'm definitely working through it because I'm not under any financial pressure now and I'm still working like a bloody Trojan. But um, I've always, it's it's worked against me and it's worked for me. It's worked against me because, you know, whenever I started the business, I massively overspent um, on, you know, Facebook ads and different things to get the 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 face the business up and running. And I, 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 but I also overspent my private life. Like I went on holidays. I couldn't afford, not I couldn't afford, well, actually I couldn't afford them actually. Well, I could afford them, but they were putting me under pressure. And I bought loads of stuff and whatever. And I was living as if I had already made it when I hadn't yet. This is about two years ago when I first started the business. And I was on holiday one day and I looked at my bank account and I realized in my business bank account, I had less than a thousand pounds, less than a thousand pounds in my business bank account. And I was spending 600 pounds a day on Facebook ads. Now, luckily the money was flowing into the business because I had a monthly recurring revenue model, but I nearly shit myself and I had to, 
Um, I had to shut off all the ads and I had to create programs quickly. And that's where the four week shred came from. I, it was created out of a need to make money in the business. And it really did. It was fantastic. But um, I seem to have this, this pattern where I put myself under financial pressure in order to perform better. Um, now, it's worked really, really well for me because it's meant that I'm not afraid to invest money. The team that I have at the minute, I have invested in very heavily, like my creative director, Mark, who I was talking about, who edits these podcasts, um, well, actually, who controls all of the creative stuff in the whole company. He doesn't just edit the podcast. In fact, that's the lowliest job that he does. We really should have a podcast editor. Sorry, Mark. It's way below his pay grade. But um, he, I couldn't afford Mark whenever I first took him on. Um, and it's weird to talk about him knowing that he's listening to this, but I couldn't afford Mark. Uh, he knows the story. Whenever he took him on, like I, Mark made all my videos and he was wildly expensive. And I remember saying to him, I, he was helping me find a video, a video creative director to make videos within the company, come work for us full time. And every one I sent me was like, no, no, they're shit. No, that's terrible. No, you can't use them. And I was like, okay, Mark, give me your price. Give me your price to come work for me. And he was like, no, no, I can't. I haven't worked for anyone for years. You know, I work for myself. And I was like, no, no, Mark, come on, come on. Like, let's do this. So he gave me his price and I was like, okay, I can't afford it. But you know what? I don't care what I have to do. I have to sell my soul every month. I will, I will make that money. And I could not afford, my monthly cash flow did not allow me, did not afford me. I couldn't afford to pay Mark's wage, but I, but I found a way and I did it. And Mark has been massively instrumental in the growth of this company and, um, and now is a, is a profit shareholder in the company. And so, you know, so the, so the point I'm saying is you have to, there, there comes a point where you have to not be afraid to invest in something which you think is a really, really, really good idea. And I knew in my heart of hearts, I've always hired my whole team on instinct. And I hired Mark on, well, not on instinct because he already made shit hot videos for us. So it was instinct with data. But I also knew we would work really, really well together. And I just knew that it was the right decision. I knew I wasn't going to find anyone like Mark with his work ethic, with his talent, with his creativity. And I just knew that, you know, I could, I could like, you know, half asset and try and find someone cheaper but at the end of the day you get what you pay for in life you get what you pay for mark is was one of the most creative expensive creative directors i'd ever worked for because he was the best you know <laughs> people who know they're good aren't afraid to charge it so if you you know if you want to cut corners and go with someone cheaper you can't expect to get a rolls royce for the price of a of a, of a i was gonna say trying to think of an international car that everybody knows the price of a, a mini over here, right? I don't know whether you guys have minis in Australia or in America, whatever, but um, you can't expect to get a really expensive car for a really cheap car. It just doesn't work that way. So you have to be willing to invest. So my my propensity to overspend actually has, has done me well um, and it's kept the business constantly needing to grow in order to pay the bills. And that's been really, really, really good because we've been growing and growing and growing. And of course, one of our biggest, massive, the biggest growth the company has ever had was during... COVID-19 whenever I thought that the, the business was going to go under. I was convinced I was going to have to close the business. I had a 100,000 point credit card bill to pay. A launch had gone tits up. I had a whole team to pay and we we literally turned the business around, pulled it out of the bag and tripled our turnover. Tripled our turnover. In fact, I think I want to say yes, tripled our turnover in the first quarter of this year during COVID-19. And so the biggest financial pressure I ever had in my life turned into the biggest financial win I've ever had in my life. So they always say your biggest weakness is also your biggest strength. My biggest weakness is I overspend. It's also one of my biggest strengths because it keeps me in a perpetual state of growth, which has been really, really, really good for me. Okay, number four. Um, <laughs> this is actually a funny one, right? Which is kind of more to do with um, my home life or whatever. So um, I haven't washed my own clothes in two years. Now, before you go, oh, you stinker, I don't mean I haven't washed my clothes in two years. I haven't washed my own clothes in two years. Why is this? Because I have a housekeeper. In fact, I don't have one housekeeper. I have two. Yep, I have two housekeepers. I have Lorraine, who is my full-time housekeeper, who works nine to five, actually eight to five, Monday to Friday. And then I have Antoinette, who is my weekend housekeeper, who works on a Saturday and a Sunday. And so um, I have not washed my own clothes or ironed my own clothes or cleaned my own house in over two years. Um, why is this something that I'm embarrassed to tell you? Because recently, whenever my daughter was in hospital, Ryan went home to get her some a bag of clothes. Whenever we knew she was going to be admitted, he went home to get her a bag of clothes and he, he messaged me and he said, uh, where are Maya's pajamas kept? And I was like, I don't know. And he went, what do you mean you don't know? And I said, well, they're in her room. And he goes, yeah, but whereabouts in her room? I was like, Ryan, I have no clue. And he was like, how, do you, how can you not know where her pajamas are kept? I was like, well, do you know where her pajamas are kept? 
And he was like, no, but you're her mother. And I was like, well, I don't fucking look after her. And so I had this moment where we were laughing and he was like opening and closing all the drawers in her room, trying to find her pajamas because I don't put her clothes away because I don't wash her clothes. I don't iron her clothes and I don't take care of her clothes. And I haven't for two years because Lorraine, my housekeeper, does that. And um, But it was quite funny. The, the hospital staff were laughing at me. They were like, how can you not know where your daughter's clothes are? I was like, I have a housekeeper. I'm really sorry. So um, so yeah, and also now, now it's beginning to happen with the kitchen because we obviously have a, a full-time private chef at home as well. And Ryan will say to me, uh, do we have any soy sauce? And I'll be like, I don't know. Or he'll say, do you have any miso soup? I don't know. I'm like, I really, I just don't know what's in my cupboards anymore because I don't cook anymore because I have a, a private chef. He works at 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday and he also cooks and leaves food for the weekend. So, um, but, so why do I have these things? Well, the thing about it is a lot of people ask me why I've been successful. And the reason why, one of the reasons why I've been successful is because I was forced through being a stay-at-home mom to four young kids and four young homeschooled kids and um, also training to become a bikini athlete, I was forced to replace myself wherever I could in order to buy myself more time. And one of the areas where it, that took up the most amount of my time was housework, housekeeping and looking after the kids. And so I remember um, as soon as I started making any kind of income, because I had asked Ryan before, I'd said, please, can we afford a housekeeper? And he was like, absolutely, we cannot. And I was like, just a few hours a week, just like, I said, like three hours a day, 15 hours a week. I said, I've worked out, it'll cost X amount of money. He was like, Kim, we can't afford it because, you know, we were, we live in a big house. We had four kids. I didn't work. Ryan earned, you know, a, a good, reasonable salary, very good salary. But, it, you know, we had an expensive lifestyle. So there wasn't a lot of, you know, money left at the end of the month. And quite often there was more month left at the end of the money. So he was like, we cannot afford a housekeeper. So the minute that I started making money, any kind of income, I hired a housekeeper. All I could afford, I hired Lorraine. She's been amazing. She's like second mother to my kids. And she... um she started working 15 hours a week, three hours a day. That's all I could afford. I paid her 10 pounds an hour, so 150 pounds a week. And uh, and she was amazing. And I gained, right? I gained 15 hours a week that I didn't have before. And not only did she come in and, you know, be there with the kids and stuff in the morning, but she did the laundry, she tidied the house, she emptied the dishwasher, she did the stuff. So whenever I came home at, you know, at midday, she was there nine till 12, the place was clean and tidy and the clothes were put away and the laundry was done and I wasn't having to come home and start to do all that. And you have no idea, well, you probably do if you have kids in the house, you have no idea what that did to me and did for my time. It didn't just buy me three hours of time. It bought me more time in the afternoon because there was other times I could do stuff, I could train, I could, you know, if I was prepping for a show, I could, you know, do cardio or go to the sauna or you know, I grew my business. Everyone goes, some people love to say, oh, it's all right for you because you have a housekeeper and a chef. And I'm like, no, 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 sweetheart. I didn't have any of this in the beginning. I I did everything myself. I homeschooled my kids. I did all the laundry, all of the cooking, all of the cleaning. And I grew my business at, while doing two hours cardio a day, half an hour in the sauna, an hours training in the gym and training and all of the prep that I needed to do to compete on stage. I was a fucking machine. So, you know, I didn't have anything in the, in the beginning, but I knew that if I replaced myself in those areas um, really quickly, that that would buy me more time. And so the, I did, I started investing in, after Lorraine, I invested in Alan, who is um, our director of design and development in the company. He came to work for me just designing PDFs and websites and things just on an hourly rate. He's now full time with the company um, and he is absolutely not only instrumental. He does all our PDFs, all our creative work, all of our web work. He literally runs the machine that is the Sculpted Vegan in the background. He built the company with me from scratch. Alan has been with me from the very beginning, from day one. And um, and he's amazing. And so so he was the second person I hired. And then I, I got Lorraine in for more hours to work longer. And that bought me more time. And I just kept replacing myself, replacing myself, replacing myself in the, in the areas where I could. So that now in the business, now, right today, with the team that I have, the only work that I do in the company, and this is a tip for any of you growing a business, the only work that I do in the company is the work that no one else can do. No one else can do what I do. No one else can record these podcasts. No one else can record the videos. No one else can write the programs, do the creative work. No, you know, there's no one else can do what I do. So I only do the things that only I can do. And we have people to do everything else. In fact, we recently just hired a content writer, Marissa. And what Marissa does is she um, she now listens to my podcast. We take the top podcasts that 
I've recorded and she takes the podcasts and she transcribes them and she creates them or makes them into downloadable PDFs, free PDFs that we run Facebook ad traffic to. Then we, whenever we run the Facebook ad traffic to it, then we um, people go into a funnel and and then they get offered different programs depending on which one they have have um, have signed up for. So one that we have just created, Marissa has just created from uh, the podcast and different notes that we had was how to get rid of cellulite. So we've created a, a free PDF called how to get rid of cellulite. Um, without expensive creams or surgery, we're going to start running Facebook ad traffic to that and then we're going to sell the butt camp on the back of it because anyone who's interested in getting rid of cellulite may be interested in the butt camp. So it's a way to not only give incredible value to people but also that to offer them products or services which may help to change their lives. So um, so I don't even write the PDFs anymore. I just record the content this way or record videos and that, the, that content is then made into written content. So it's still my words and my concepts but someone else writes it up and then that goes into the funnel to create money for the company. So if you want to be successful, you have to really get to a place where you're only doing the things that only you can do. And if that means not doing laundry at home, then I'm all for that. I have no shame in the fact that I do zero laundry, zero housework, zero cooking, none whatsoever. So that's a big tip for you, any of you guys growing a business. Okay. Number five. Well, this one does cause me a wee bit of shame, I have to say, but I think I've learned to live with it and I'll tell you why. So number five is, quite honestly, I don't see much of my kids anymore. And that's the honest to God's truth. And when I say I don't, when I say I don't see much of them, I don't, I don't, I used to spend every waking hour with my kids. I co-slept with them. I, I spent, you know, I was there all day. I never worked. I was there with them all day. I, I did everything with them. We went everywhere together. I took them to their tennis lessons. I cooked for them. I fed them. I was there for my four children the whole way to, to they were growing up. My Jack is eight. Uh, so I started the business when Jack was six. Um, so up until Jack was six, I was there 24-7 with the children. Ryan really did nothing with the children. He's very South He was born and raised in South Africa, moved to Australia when he was 12. So he's very South African in, in a lot of his DNA, which is, well, all of his DNA, all of his primitives are South African, actually, and which is very much that he, the man, doesn't really do anything with the children, rather. Ryan never did a night feed. Even though I was breastfeeding, my kids would all take a bottle. He never did a night feed. He never got up with the kids in the middle of the night. He never nursed them or cleaned up after them or, you know, or, or sued them when they were sick. He never really ever took them out anywhere either, to be honest. You know, it was always me who did everything with them. And, um, and so I was there with him every single waking hour. And then whenever I started the business, obviously, you know, my time was split and, and whatever. It was hard for me. And now... I I work like it's seven o'clock in the evening here um, and I'm still in the office. Now we have a launch this weekend or a masterclass this weekend. So I am working late almost every night this week. But see between doing an hour's cardio in the morning and then going training to the gym and then coming here to the office and working all day. And then I'll come home from here maybe about eight or 9 p.m. and I'll go for an hour's walk tonight. I'll do another. I have to take the dog out for a good hour walk in the evening. So I do about seven kilometers when I go home. I usually don't get home till about 10 p.m. many nights. And my kids don't go to bed till really late. So they're all up anyway. Anyway, so I see them and I give them a kiss and a hug and whatever, but I don't spend a lot of time with them. I never work on the weekend if I can help it. So on the weekend we do, we go for donuts, we go shopping, we go for lunch, we order pizza, we have family parties. And so I see them a lot on the weekend. And I guess this is how most men are, you know, most men who work and women are at home. But I, I, I felt guilty about it for a long time until I realized something recently. And actually, it was this morning. It was I didn't I realized this recently. But this morning cemented it for me, right? It was funny. I was uh, I was going to the gym this morning, and I was leaving at about nine thirty. I'd already done my cardio, had a shower, and Lorraine was already there, you know, faffing around doing laundry and different things. And um, I walked past Maya's room, and Maya went, Lorraine. She was awake, and but her you know curtains were closed, and she went, Lorraine. And I went, No, not Lorraine, mummy. And she went, Oh. And I went, Not really much of a difference though, Lorraine, mummy, same thing. What do you need? And I went in and I gave her a kiss, and she said, Oh, I was I was going to ask Lorraine if she would um if she would make me some breakfast. And I said, yeah. And then Lorraine came in, she was like, Morning, sweetie, and she gave her a hug and a kiss too. And I said, She goes, Are you away to the gym, mummy? I said, Yeah, I'm away to the gym. See you later. And she was like, Bye. And I went off, and Lorraine was like, What would you like, pet? And she sat down in the bed and started stroking her hair and. And I was like, and as I left, I thought, you know what? You know, here's the thing, what I realized about kids. Kids get really um, upset. My kids used to get upset whenever I left or whenever I went away on holiday without them. And I was younger, a few days with the girls, whatever, out for the night. They would have been like, oh, you know, what, what are we going to do if mommy's not here? And they would have been like, you know, worried if I wasn't going to be there and that kind of stuff. And what I realized recently was it wasn't that they really were terribly attached to me as a person. It was more that they were attached to what I did for them as a mother. Kids are very concerned about their own needs. Kids are very, uh, as they should be, you know, a lot of their needs are wired for survival. 
And if the mother is the person who takes care of them the most and looks after them and makes their food and does all those things, then then if the mother isn't there, if they if they have never had to depend on the father to do those things for them, they don't know if the father can do them or take care of them in the way they need to be taken care of. So they get worried about the mother not being there. But my kids are never worried about me being there because I don't take care of them anymore. Lorraine and Lee, our chef, take take care of them, right? And Ryan is there. He works from home now. So if they need to go somewhere, need to do something, or they want something bought for them, Kai wanted a tent the other day. Ryan took them to decathlon and bought them this massive tent for the garden. And and this was great. And they were sleeping in the tent that night. And, And so, you know, because I don't take care of their needs, the, ki- the kids love me. I love them. We have such a special relationship. We snuggle and we hug and we kiss and we go places. And, and you know, we went out for lunch on Saturday, just me and the kids. And Ryan didn't want to go. And we have such great fun together. But they're not dependent on me to take care of their needs. So they don't mind if I'm not there. And they don't, they don't mind if I'm there. And they don't mind if I'm not there. It's like they love me like I love Ryan, but I'm not dependent on him. You know, I'm, he's not dependent on me to be there to cook his dinner. So he doesn't miss me if I'm not there. He likes me to be there because we like spending time together. But if I don't go home from the office till 10 o'clock, Ryan's not like, oh my God, my, my evening was so terrible because I had to cook my own dinner. You know, Ryan has been very well taken care of by the people I've hired to take care of my family. So I've replaced myself in many ways at home. I've replaced myself with a chef, replaced myself with a um, with a, a housekeeper, replaced myself with a weekend housekeeper. Um Oh, Ryan always says all I need to do is find someone for him to have sex with, and he's and he's totally sorted. <laughs> but um, but it's but it's true. I have I've replaced myself at home, and so the kids aren't like, oh my god, and where's my mommy? And I really need my mommy. If I'm away, they don't mind because they know their needs are taken care of. So it's a very very special. You 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 can develop a very special and deep relationship with your child that isn't based on need or what you can do for them, which is based on something much richer, much deeper. And so I've come to terms with the fact that I just don't see my kids the same way that I used to. But actually. As kids go, they are thriving, they're happy, they're joyful, they're purposeful, they love their lives, they have no issues, they're not being bullied, they have no insecurities or or eating disorders or 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 any kind of, you know, worries or cares or weird behaviors, nothing. My kids are so joyful, wonderful, purposeful, happy, wonderful, loving beings. And so as far as parenting goes, I don't think I'm doing too badly. So I have decided that I'm not going to feel guilty about it anymore. Okay, number six. I still hate my butt. And many of you will be like, what do you mean? How can you hate your butt? And I'm like, okay, this one was hard for me to write, okay? Because, and people say to me all the time, oh, you should just love yourself the way you are. You shouldn't, you know, women should just embrace every part of themselves, their cellulite and their fat. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And if that's you, if you're like, I love every part of myself, my stretch marks are my tiger stripes. I earned those bad boys. I'm like, you rock on, sweetheart. That's not how I feel about my stretch marks, but I totally admire the fact that you do. <laughs> yeah, I don't really have very many stretch marks actually, but if I had them, I know that I would probably hate them and I would want to laser them or get rid of them or something because I wouldn't run the business that I run if I wasn't body conscious or into body image. But here's the thing, okay? I spent fucking years trying to make my ass better. Now, don't get me wrong. My ass is better than it was. In fact, my ass is really quite good for a 41-year-old's bum. But I'm, I'm fighting a losing battle here, guys, because gravity is seriously going against me. My skin is sagging faster than I can build muscle. And that is just a fucking fact. And it's really pissing me off because whenever I started bodybuilding, I was 37. Now I'm 41. That was four years ago, okay? Your skin sags a lot in four years. It sags far more than your glutes build. So even though, you know, I can like, you know, I know how to hold my butt, I know how to bend my knees slightly, lift my hips, tilt them, you know, arch my back, you know, make my butt look great when I walk and all the rest of it. It's still never going to be the way that I want it to be in my mind without surgery. And even if I did get surgery and got like some kind of butt implants or injections, which I would never do, by the way, but not judging anyone who has. It's just I don't think I could ever not sit for that long. I think it would drive me insane. But um, I, I... I just I do need to oh, I've lost my train of thought now. I do need to accept my butt the way I am oh yeah no here it is so I, my butt will never be truly the way I want it to be we were on vacation recently in Marbella in Spain and this girl walked across the beach and I was like fuck Ryan I was like look at her look at her ass look at her ass everyone in, in Spain wears thongs right thong bikinis no matter what age you are whether you're 12 or you're fucking 80 right everyone's wearing a thong there's a lot of women wearing thongs that shouldn't be wearing thongs just saying no judgment 
<laughs> well, just a wee bit of judgment in there, Kim, actually. But um, so everyone's wearing thongs. This girl walked across the beach, and I swear to God, she had a fucking epic body. Now, she obviously worked really hard. She was muscular. You could see that she had worked her glutes like crazy. She had, a, she, and she had a massive implants, right? So she had the boobs to balance it. Uh, but she just looked incredible. And I was like, I want glutes like hers. And all I could think was, I can't work my glutes any more than I work them. Like, I ain't literally, I'm doing, well, I'm probably not doing everything that I can. I could, I probably could, you know, work them. You know, if I really committed, I could like add in extra glute workouts every week. I do two glute workouts a week. I could probably work in like another four. But the problem is I already train five days a week and I do two hours cardio a day because I'm on a shred at the minute and I'm running a fucking multi-million dollar business and I have four children at home and I have a big team of worldwide, worldwide team who I'm trying to manage as well. And I'm like, is it really important enough to me to fit in another four glute workouts a week? <laughs> and that is the bottom line. You have to choose your poison. You have to choose your sacrifice. But there is a part of me is like, I just wish my bum didn't wobble the way it wobbled. And I just wish that it was slightly different. I don't have any cellulite, which is wonderful because I've loads of muscle and not very much fat. Um, but I just, you know, I know that it's terrible and you shouldn't wish, you know, most women would kill to have my glutes and kill to have my thighs and kill to have my body. And they, they would just think, oh my God, if I just had that body, I would be abs, I would just, you know, my life will be complete. And I totally get that. And I hate the fact that I'm admitting that I still don't like my glutes. But I don't think I'll ever be 100% happy with my body. And if I was 100% happy with my body, I would probably have to close the business because I wouldn't be striving for more. I'm always striving for more. I'm always striving for better. I'm always striving for newer ways and faster ways to be successful. And so I wouldn't have the business if I did, if I did hit my body, if I didn't still hit, hit my butt because I am a complete perfectionist, which actually leads us in very nicely to uh, point number seven or to 10 things, number seven thing that you didn't know about me that I'm embarrassed about, uh, which is I am a complete and utter perfectionist. Now, here's the caveat or here's the juxtaposition, right? I am a complete and utter perfectionist in many ways, but then in other ways, I'm not. I know what to be a perfectionist about. And there's things that, and I think I'm not a perfectionist about things really that other people are doing. Now I'm thinking, am I? Because there's other ways that I really am. So here, it's not that I'm perfectionist. Let me try and break this down a wee bit. I'm not afraid to say what I want. And I do believe that very high standards are important. So we just hired a new chef called Lee. And Lee is absolutely and utterly amazing. Okay. Amazing. And everyone's like, well, what happened to Ian? What happened to Ian? Well, actually, what happened to Ian was Ian was with us six months and he and I decided it was time for him to move on. It just wasn't a good fit anymore. Um, and and it was all very amicable. It was wonderful. He was amazing. He he worked so hard for the family when he was there, but we just really weren't a good fit together. And personality-wise, his food was incredible. He was very skilled. But personality-wise, we just didn't really fit together as well as I believed that we could. And so um, he's moved on and we hired a new chef called Lee, who was a head chef for 11 years and a massive restaurant in Belfast. Uh, really lovely guy. And so I, but I'm not afraid to say to him, Lee, I said, you know, he made me some, he was making me different food or whatever. And I said, just, I said, sometimes I've had quite a lot, you know, a few woody stalks from the kale in my salad. Can you just make sure that you strip all the stalks off before you do, you know, before you do the kale? And he was like, oh, right. Okay. No problem at all. I'm really sorry about that. I was like, no need to be sorry. I'm just not, you know, I'm just not afraid to say it. So if something like that happens, I'll be like, oh, by the way, I prefer this. And can you do this? And can you make sure this? And I'm not afraid to say what I want. I'm not afraid to stand up and say, can you do it this way? Can you do it this way? Can you do it this way? Because I think that high standards are super important. There was one day that I recorded a podcast. And after I recorded the podcast, I was like, oh, I knew that it didn't really flow very well. I, I love to tell stories, as you know, in my podcast and go off in tangents, but I always bring it back to the main point at the end. So I, I don't go off on a tangent so much as I take you on a journey. And then at the end, I sum it all up. And this podcast, I hadn't really, I was like, oh, I'm just not sure if I really felt it or, you know, I, I didn't, not sure I really got brought home what I was wanting to say. And after my podcasts are are released, I listen to every single podcast. I go walking the dog and I listen to my own podcast. The reason I do this is because I want to hear where I've said, you know, um, I know I say, you know, a lot, you know, uh, you know, and I listen, I go, fuck, I have to stop saying that. So I listen because I want to see one, did I bring it home? Did I bring it uh, full circle? Did I, did I make a good point and take you through a journey? Was I eloquent and articulate in what I was saying? Two, do I say really annoying things like, you know, and um, do I say M a lot or whatever? I want to hear 
the the fillers that I use so I can stop using them to make me a better speaker. And there's and and through the I just enjoy uh improving, I guess. And so I'm always looking for ways to improve, which is why I read everything that I do, I listen to everything I do, I watch all my videos just to see where I can improve. And so there was one day I was listening to the podcast and I got about 20 minutes in and I stopped it and I messaged Mark, my creative director, and I was like, Mark, take the podcast down. I, I said, I'm going to re-record it. And he was like, no, it's fine. He said, it's like, it's not your best podcast, but it's totally fine. I was like, no, I can't. I cannot have it out there when I do not feel happy with it. Take it down. I'm going to re-record. And he was like, okay, fuck, whatever you say. And I was I was walking uh, walking the dog. It must have been about 7 p.m. And I got home at about quarter to eight. And I said to Ryan, I'm going to, the, I'm going to the office to record another podcast. And I got in the car and I drove to the office and I recorded the same podcast, but I did it properly. And I I really pulled together the notes. I was much more articulate, much more eloquent. And we we put it up. And a couple of people had said to me, hey, I was listening to this halfway and I got halfway through and then it disappeared. What happened? You know, they were, they'd started to listen to it as it had been published. And so uh, Mark was like, Kim, you can't, everything you put out cannot be perfect. And I was like, yes, it can. <laughs> yes, it can. <laughs> Peace and cards, peace and cards, peace and cards. Yes, I can. Nah, 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 like my fingers in my ears. And uh, but I am a complete perfectionist. I don't mind working hard. I don't mind working late. I don't. I want something to be as good as it can be. But then on the other side, I am willing to put something out there just to get it out there. So I'm not anal about detail in terms of oh, I need to make sure every tiny little detail is correct before I release this. I'm like it's good enough. Get it out there, and we'll fix it after we go. So I'm a perfectionist about how I deliver information. I'm a perfectionist about the about um about going the extra mile. If you've ever if you follow me on Instagram, you'll know that I respond to every comment on every single post. I respond to every single DM. I respond to every message on Facebook. I I I think if you're gonna do something, do it right. Take care of people. Show them you care. Be interested in your customer. Go the extra mile. Go the extra mile. It's rarely crowded. If you're going to do something, do it well. Do it with passion. Do it with drive. Do it to the very, very best of your ability. Do it until you are proud of it. And if you're not proud of it, don't do it. And you can be proud of something and it not be 100% perfect. But as long as you're saying it's the it's as good as it can be right now, then that's okay. But if you ever put something out there that isn't as good as it can be, then that's okay. Like the other week I recorded a podcast and I didn't think it was my best podcast. I didn't, I didn't really bring it together. I rambled, I, you know, rambled a bit in it. And I said to Mark, I messaged him and I was like, it, this isn't the best podcast I've ever put out, but you know what? I don't have time or energy to re-record. So it's just going to have to go out there. And so I accepted it and I left it and I put it out there. But if I could have re-recorded it, I would. But at that point I was like, I'm struggling with time and I just don't have the time to make it perfect. So it's just something's going to have to give and it's going to have to go out imperfect. So you have to make decisions to be imperfect whenever you can. And if you can make something perfect, make it perfect, but don't obsess over it. But I am a complete perfectionist and it is one of my greatest strengths, one of my greatest weaknesses, but it's also one of my greatest strengths. It's why I'm successful. You know, I I am um, I go at a hundred miles an hour all the time. I I I am so in tune with my community, with what they want, with the questions they're asking, with the struggles and the fears that people are having. I'm there all the time. You know, I go the extra mile every single day. And that's why I'm now running a multiple seven figure turnover company because I go the extra mile. It's not crowded, guys. If you go the extra mile, you'll always, always get to the finish line. Okay, let's move on. What else am I doing? Oh, that leads really nicely into the next one. It's funny how they all lead into one another. I must have just my train of thought must have been going this way. Number eight of things that I am embarrassed to tell you. I am obsessed with my phone. <laughs> not obsessed with my phone in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of I, I've just picked up my phone actually there and I was distracted by it. I was like, oh my God, I have like a hundred messages. Um, so, but I, I'm not obsessed with my phone as in like, I love my phone. Yes, it's an iPhone 11. It's an iPhone Pro Max. It's like the best phone that there is on the market, but that's not why I'm obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with my phone because I have so much going on in the online world that I can access through my phone, that I am constantly, constantly on it. I actually suffer during launches, at the minute I have it, during launches, I suffer repetitive strain injury in my right hand because I, I'm on my phone so much. I had to get a phone with a built-in pop socket to hold to hold my phone, to, get, to take the strain off the back of my hand because I was resting the phone on my little finger constantly on my right hand. 
and I uh, I was getting really bad strain and so I now have repetitive strain injury from holding the bloody pop socket on the back and my right hand is sore at the minute because we're in the middle of two launches and there's so much going on but I would be on I was actually going to pick it up there to look how often I'm on the bloody phone but I would say I think Facebook last week was like or not Facebook iPhone told me they were like your iPhone usage is down from um, 8 hours and 24 minutes to this week to 6 hours and 42 minutes so I was like 6 hours and 42 minutes a day from like 8 hours and something like that's how that's actually no it wasn't 8 hours it wasn't as much I think it's 5 hours I think I average like 5 and a half to 6 hours a day on my phone. Now, that's in a 24-hour period, okay? And I sleep for a good eight to nine hours of that 24-hour period. So, uh, well, maybe seven hours at the minute. I'm not getting to sleep till quite late because we have so much going on. And um, and I'm on my phone continually. Now, what am I doing on my phone? But it, so I'm, but here's the thing, here's why it's bad, right? I am, um, I am, I think I'm honestly addicted to it. I I'm addicted to the little dopamine hits that I get continually from the Facebook groups, from Instagram, from checking my sales continually, from checking, you know, not even so much email because I don't, uh, Christina, my assistant manages all my email, but I, I check sales every day, multiple times a day because we sell so many different products and different types of products. And uh, and I love to check in on my sales, my daily sales total. Um, I check in on my Facebook groups, check in on my Instagram. I check in on uh, how much is in my PayPal account, how much is in my Stripe account. Like I have like a little, and they check on the Facebook business page. I check in on my ads. So I have a little like a little routine of things that I check in on. First thing in the morning, I check in on sales. Then I go to Instagram and I answer all of the messages and I look at all the comments and the posts. Then after that, I go, where do I go after that? Then I go into Facebook and I do check Facebook and I go through all the groups and I do messages and check-ins and chat to everybody in all my groups. Then I go into the Facebook business page and I check all of the different things, Facebook business page. Again, my team look after the Facebook business page. They answer all the inquiries. They answer all of the comments on the ads. They answer all of the, the comments on on my um on the posts that I put on my Facebook business page that go there from Instagram. So they manage that. But I just like to check in and see what are people asking? What are people saying? What are people commenting? How many comments does that get? I have the finger on the pulse of every single part of my business. And then from there, I usually go into my ads and I check on my ads. How much should I spend? What ads do we have running? You know, what ads are performing well? What is the ad cost of the different, you know, ad spend? And then from there, I go into my email and I check my email. Excuse me. And then I go, um, I can't even remember where I go. And then I and then I I think I go into my bank account and I check my bank account and then I go into Stripe and I check how much is my Stripe account. Then I go into PayPal, check my PayPal account. And then you know what I do? I sometimes go back and do it all over again. Then I go back into Instagram and I see is there another message because I get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages every day on Instagram. So it's like you get a wee dopamine hit every time you open it. It's like every, I don't even check the likes and comments. I do check the comments. I don't check the likes anymore because there's hundreds and thousands and thousands every single day. And so I don't, you know, get to see them all, but I get like, I'm constantly on this roundabout of checking, checking, checking. I get millions of WhatsApp messages. I have my coaching groups. I have my groups with my team. I have our family groups. Like my phone is a, hive of activity. And see, on holiday, we went away to Marbella recently for a week and I bought two books in the airport. Two books in the airport. Do you know how many of them I read? None. And yet, gone are the times for me when I used to go away on vacation and read a book or two books or four books or five books. Now, whenever I go to the beach, I'm just on my phone. I'm checking in with my groups. I'm checking in with everything. I never set my fucking phone down. But it also sometimes then it gets to the point where I'm lying in bed at night and I'm going, in my head, I'm going, Kim, put the phone down. Put the phone down. Kim, put the phone down. But it's like, I can't physically put it down. I'm so connected to my online world that it's so hard to put it down. But again, like you can turn every negative into a positive. You can say, well, that's really bad that you're obsessed with your phone, Kim. It's also the reason why I know what's happening in every single dark corner of my business. I go into the Facebook groups. For those of you who have bought a program from me, I go into my Facebook groups sometimes for two to three hours a day checking comments, looking at the posts, reading what people have written, replying to people. You'll know people are always in there going, God, Kim, I can't believe you're so busy and you're in here replying to my, my comment. I'm like, of course I'm replying to your comment. This is my company and you've bought one of my programs and you're asking a question and I know the answer. So, you know, I'm in there every day. People can't believe it though because most time you buy a program from a big influencer and you never hear from them. You go into their Facebook group and you, you chat with all the other members, but like you never, ever, ever hear from the influencer. I remember years ago buying a program from a very big influencer and I went into her um, into her Facebook group and she was never in there. I think I, I once she commented on one of my pictures and someone was like, oh, you got a comment from, you know, this, this, this person or whatever. And I, and this was like a big thing that she had commented on one of my pictures. 
And that's because, you know, she was seen like a mini celebrity because she was never in the bloody group. And so I, uh, you know, I just am so connected with my community. So it's a good thing as well. It's the reason why I'm successful. It's that going the extra mile again. And also I catch the mistakes. I know what's going on. I know what's happening. I, you know, I, I know I have a finger on the pulse of every single thing that's happening in my business. But on the flip side, it's exhausting sometimes, you know, it's just, it's not even exhausting. I love it. It's not exhausting at all. I absolutely love it. But sometimes I just, I go, just switch off, Kim. And if I've been away from my phone for like an hour or two hours or three hours, whenever I almost start to get anxiety, <laughs> I get like, I don't get anxiety, but I, I feel like there's something missing in my life and I can't wait to get back to my phone. I can't wait to get into Facebook, into Instagram, into, you know, into my messages. I can't wait to, you know, get back into my virtual online world. Um, and so I don't know what the answer to this problem is. Nothing, I don't think, because it's serving me very well to do it, except that I need to get some kind of device that is stopping me from getting repetitive strain injury. Maybe I should create one, actually. Maybe there's a market for other people who are obsessed with their phones like I am. But I guess it's just because, you know, I'm. it's not like I'm just like surfing. I'm not surfing the web. I'm like... I'm like connecting with the hundreds of thousands of people that I connect with all around the world every single day. Um, so that does take an awful lot of effort and that's why I'm obsessed with my phone. Okay, moving on, nearly finished. Number nine, um, my first business was a complete fraud. <laughs> so uh, let me tell you what happens whenever you uh, try to create a business just to make money. It's not successful. <laughs> so whenever I was younger, and I was living under the oppressive regime of Ryan Constable. Now all you're ever going to know about Ryan is, people. you, you guys always probably all, probably all have a terrible internal representation of Ryan. Number one, everyone will always remember Ryan as, the, people write to me and they say, I can't look at him anymore after your farting story, Kim. If you haven't listened to my farting story, go to, I don't know what episode it is, I think it's 42. Um, it's called My Boyfriend Slept With a Prostitute and It Changed My Life. Uh, it wasn't Ryan, by the way. He's not my boyfriend. He's my husband. But um, so people love that episode. But I told a story about Ryan and his farting and it, right? And the fart that he did that I, where I told him that uh, he, uh, what was it I said to him? You disgust every fiber of my soul. And he thought this was the funniest thing he had ever heard. Pulled out the big guns to try and make him stop farting. I told him that he disgusted every fiber of my soul. And you would have thought that I had awarded him the Nobel Prize. He thought that this was his, literally all of his work was done. He was the happiest he'd ever been in his entire life because it, it confirmed just how talented he was to be able to perform such a smelly fart. And so everybody knows Ryan as the farter. And now you know him as the, uh, the, the Kim living under the oppressive regime of Ryan Constable. Um, so not really, but whenever I, I, I was at home and I was with the kids and I realized life wasn't all cracked up to me as a stay-at-home mom. I decided that I was going to start a business and make money. So eight years ago, uh, after Jack was born, I started to dive into the world of internet marketing. That's why I was able to make the Sculpted Vegan successful, FYI. I had studied internet marketing for six years, trying and failing and trying and failing to make businesses successful. So I'd had some experience in the online world, which is why I was able to take that experience and plug it into the world of fitness and make it successful. So I wasn't an overnight success. I'm an eight-year overnight success. And uh, so I want to try and make my own money. And so I started a business called the Work at Home Moms Network. Now, why did I start this business? Because before that, I had started quite a few businesses. I had, but I was, I, well, I hadn't really started businesses. I was more, I was self-employed. So I'd been moderately successful being self-employed as a stay-at-home mom and working around my kids. I'd worked as an audio typist, were, uh, working for a local television station, television company. Um, and they used to send the audio typing to my house and I would have audio done audio typing while the kids were sleeping just to earn some extra cash. Um, I had worked as a portrait artist. I'm actually a very talented artist, believe it or not. My family are all talented artists. And I used to uh, recreate photos into pencil drawings for people. And they used to pay me um, like a high charge, like 150 pounds for a portrait. So I thought I was like the richest person in the world if I did one or two of these a week. Uh, and so I had had, and then I'd also um, started a multilingual children's company where um, I I had taught my, I had employed people to teach my kid Chinese Chinese and Spanish, and then I decided that other kids may want to learn this as well. So I employed different people to go around different houses and teach these kids Spanish and Chinese, and that was moderately successful as well. And so I believed that I was qualified to teach other women how to start successful businesses from home. But I was a complete fraud because I hadn't really started a successful business from home myself. So I was kind of learning as I go. So it really was the kind of um, what do they call it? The, the fake, fake it till you make it. It was kind of a case of fake it till you make it. I was definitely faking it until I hoped that I was going to make it. But the problem with faking it till you make it is, especially if you're trying to teach business, like if you're trying to teach 
business people how to run a successful business and you haven't actually run a successful business, you ain't going to do very well at it because you can't teach someone what you haven't done yourself. And that's just the bottom line. So now I'm starting a business program, as I said at the beginning of this, on on the uh, 21st of September. It's basically I'm starting a Facebook group where I'm going to be doing live coaching every month in the Facebook group. And then, as I already told you, I'm obsessed with my phone. I'm in my Facebook groups for two to three hours a day. So I am going to be teaching people, connecting with people in my Facebook group, answering their questions and doing uh, Facebook lives every month. And so uh, it's going to be $49. uh, Cancel any time. Join at your leisure, um, and I'm going to do uh, master classes, business master classes every month. And I'm only going—I'm going to teach whatever you guys want to know. So anyone who joins, I'm going to look at all the questions each month, what comes up consistently, and I'm going to de- do the next master class on that particular subject. So it's a very organic thing based on what people want to know. And uh, so I and I feel very confident teaching people that now. I can take any business, any business I believe I could look at that was at my size or smaller, and I could, or in a different mark, in a different. Um, a different genre than me, and I could look at it and I could map out a marketing strategy for that business very quickly. Why? Because I've grown my own business myself from scratch and I know exactly how to do it. So, um, but I couldn't do that whenever I had the Work at Home Moms Network because I really didn't have a fucking clue what I was doing. So I was total fraud uh, teaching people how to make <laughs> how, to, how to make money from home. What I used to do is I used to look up other successful influencers' content and then I used to repurpose it into my own content, not by like plagiarizing it or whatever, but by, you know, but by going, oh, that that must be what people want to know because this person's doing a video on this. And then I would do a video on that in my own words and teaching what I thought, but it wasn't like I'm doing now. See the way I'm talking to you now? It's so from the heart. It's just straight up. There's no messing around. People always say they feel like they're talking to a girlfriend when they listen to my podcasts. That's because what I teach now is so at the core of what I know. I'm not like reading from a sheet and going, all right, what's this next point that I want to make about this? Because I know this shit. I knew it. I knew it from my heart because I've done it and I've lived it and I've created it myself. Whenever I was repurposing other people's content, I really didn't have a clue what it was that I was teaching. I was just parroting what I was learning on the internet. That's how many businesses start. And you know what? Those businesses are never successful. Because you know why they're not successful? Because they are what they look like copycat businesses. I have so many people copycat my business now and create their, do you know how many four week shreds there are out there now? And quite a lot of times there are people who were clients of mine who are coming coming up with, um, or do you know how many times the word sculpt has been used now in online businesses and, uh, or shred as well? Those are, those are words that they literally no one was using before, not no one, but very few people were using before I started using them. Now in my, in my sphere of people who purchase my programs, oh, they keep popping up all these sculpting and shredding things. And so, you know, copycat businesses will never succeed because that people see them for what they are. They're copycat businesses. If they don't come from your heart, you haven't created them yourself, they're never going to be successful. And that's why the Work at Home Mums Network was just not successful. Okay. Number 10, something from my personal life. And this is like who I want to be and who I actually am. So number 10 of embarrassing things that you do not know about me is uh, I never practice yoga anymore. And you're like, really, Kim? That's embarrassing. I'll tell you why that's embarrassing because I I am known as being a one of you know one of the UK. I've been called the yoga detox guru. I have been uh, called one of the UK's most prolific yoga teachers, not because I'm the best yoga teacher in the UK, not by a bloody long shot, but just because I used to run such large workshops. We used to run up, we used to have 120 people come to come to workshops every single month. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's only in two workshops. 60 people per month, twice a month, used to come to my yoga detox workshops. And I also have an online yoga yoga detox company called D Yoga Tox. Now, if you asked me to come and teach you teach a yoga class, right? You said to me, threw me in one day. Kim, our yoga teacher didn't show up. Can you teach this class? 100% I could teach it. But, and I'm still flexible. I can still do the splits. I have a yoga sukhasana chair here in my office that I sit on. It's a special chair where you can sit cross-legged, sit in pigeon, sit in um, upavisto konasana, which is why I like forward fold. So many different ways you can sit. So I'm always keeping my hips open and I'm always, you know, kind of, you know, wanting to keep my body open and stretched. But I've had to admit that no matter how many times I've tried to get back into my daily yoga practice, I just can't. And you know why I just can't? I just don't have the drive for it anymore. 
I just don't. I wish that I did. But yoga for me was never about the stretch and the re relaxation and all that. Yoga for me was about, was a way that I could move my body every day. I was never into relaxing yoga. I was always into power yoga, Ashtanga yoga, re, you know, um, power vinyasa yoga, Bikram yoga. But I, now whenever I do yoga, I just want stretch and relaxation and something that feels really good. And a while back there, I said to Ryan, I'm going to commit to my daily yoga practice again every day. I think it was in February this year, February or March. And I committed and I got up every morning and I did yoga every morning for like 30 to 45 minutes every morning. And I, I think I committed to it for about a month. And then I just fell by the wayside and fell by the wayside and fell by the wayside. And now I'm, I'm on a shred. I'm getting up in the morning. I'm doing hours cardio. And then I have breakfast. Then I have a shower. Then I go to the gym. If I want to do yoga, I would have to get up an extra hour early. And at the minute, I don't get to bed till maybe midnight or 1 a.m. I go to bed about 11, 11.30, but I don't get to sleep till maybe between midnight and 1 a.m. And then I wake up at 7 or 7.30 to get on the Stairmaster. And so I don't want to get up at 6 to do yoga. It's not that important to me. And I've just had to admit that it's not that important to me anymore. Because let me tell you something. If it's important to you, you will find a way. And if it's not, you will find an excuse. And that is just the bottom line. We have women who join my butt camp program or different programs that we put out. And they get up at like 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. to do their cardio. And uh, that's because they want it. They, they they want the money. They want the challenge. They want the, you know, they want the body, whatever it is. They're motivated to get up and do it. And I have so much admiration for those women. And I, would I, if it was really important to me, if there was $10,000 dangling at the end of it, would I get up at 4 a.m.? Yeah, I probably would. But I don't, it's not that important to me. Yoga, you know, doing 30 minutes yoga a day is not that important to me. I have realized that I'd rather be strong than flexible and I've just decided to accept the fact that I am no longer a yogi. And, you know, people have asked me, am I going to run any more workshops? And a couple of times I was like, oh, you know, I might run a workshop just for fun. I said to Ryan, just for, you know, just for the laugh, I might run a, you know, a yoga detox workshop and David Lloyd. And I know if I ran one, I could literally, it would sell out within an hour because people would not, because I'm so well known now in Belfast as the sculpted vegan, people would want to come just because, and I don't say this narcissistically, it is just true. You know, people would be like, fuck, I want to come if Kim's running a yoga class, 100%, you know? And and, um, and so that's the, you know, and I know that I could do it. And I was like, then I'm like, can I really be bothered to spend my Sunday running a yoga class? I was like, no, I really couldn't. So I just don't. But um, there is a part of me who just would love to be a yogi again. And then there's a part of me is just the bigger part of me has accepted that I am no longer a yogi. And maybe one day I'll get back into my yoga practice. Who knows? But at the minute, it's just not where my head's at. And I think that, you know, with everything I have going on in my life, I just have to accept that I cannot be perfect. I cannot, you know, there's something has to give and, and, and unfortunately yoga is what it is, has given. And so, but there is a part of me is embarrassed to say, because so many, I've always said, oh yeah, I still do yoga three, four times a week. No, I just don't. And even I used to say it three, four times a week when really it was probably twice or maybe once, but in my mind, I was doing it three or four times a week. <laughs> then Ryan said to me one day, you know, you don't do yoga three or four times a week. I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. He was like, no, no, Kim, you do it once or twice. I was like, really? Mm -hmm. I think you just believe you do it three or four times, but you really don't. I was like, okay, right, thanks. Thanks, thanks for keeping me real. Thanks for keeping me right, Ryan. <laughs> So there you have it, guys. 10 things that I'm embarrassed to tell you that I feel lighter now having shared with you. I feel lighter. Definitely do feel lighter. It's very, very um, freeing, very cathartic to share things that you feel embarrassed about, especially with uh, the 80,000 people a month who download these podcasts. <laughs> uh, I hope you've all enjoyed listening to the 10 things that uh, I'm embarrassed to tell you. Um what am I going to say before I go? Guys, uh, if you're listening to this, it's not too late. If you're listening to this before the 24th of August, 2020, it's not too late to sign up for the Meal Planning Masterclass this weekend. Even if you just sign up to get my six-week shred meal plans, which I know everybody always wants to get their hands on. What are my six-week shred meal plans? Well, I'm on a six-week shred because we're going back to Marbella for a vacation in the middle of September. So I decided that I was going to get shredded in six weeks to go on vacation because it's great to have a goal to work towards. So I created meal plans for myself with recipes recipes, calorie and macro counted meal plans, and I'm giving them away for free to anyone who joins the masterclass. So not only will you learn how to calculate your own macros, exactly what your, you know, body fat is, your TDE is, how to, you know, meal plan, how to plan on my fitness pal, how to eat, you know, what proteins to eat, what carbs to eat, everything about body sculpting on a plant-based diet. You'll also get meal plans to boot as well. And it's only $97. If you go to the website, thesculptedvegan.com forward slash MPM for meal planning masterclass, sculptedvegan.com, or just go there. It's on the homepage. You'll be able to sign up for the masterclass. Um, we will also send you the 
replay. Even if you can't make it live, we will send you the replay, access uh, a PDF afterwards with all of the information we taught um, in it. So we've created a full summary document of everything that's being taught, plus a link to the replay. And you can watch that at your leisure and do all the work. And um, that's all part of the program. And if, you, uh, if you're like, nah, don't want that, but I do want the butt camp, the next butt camp competition is starting Saturday, no, not Saturday, September 7th, Monday, September 7th. We're opening the program um, and the brand new Facebook group next uh, Tuesday, the 25th of August is when it's being, uh, is when it's opened. The competition starts uh, Monday, 7th of September. Prize fund is the same, $10,000 first prize, $3,000 second, $1,000 third, $500 fourth prize and $250 fifth prize. And um, yeah, if you want to sculpt incredible glutes on an amazing body and get shredded at the same time and be in with a chance of winning all that money, then join the Butt Camp program. Go to thesculptedvegan.com and you will see the Butt Camp there um, on the homepage if you scroll down as one of our main programs. Guys, um, don't forget to leave a review if you want to win. Send me a screenshot on Instagram. Otherwise, it is adieu from me for one more week. Thank you so much for listening to the Strongest Sculpted Podcast. Hope you have a wonderful week wherever you are. Love you loads. Mwah. From my heart to your heart. Speak to you next week. Hope you'll have a wonderful week. Chat soon and bye for now.